And you will hear now these words from John's Gospel, the Word of God, as we find it in the first chapter of that Gospel, beginning with verse 43 and reading through the end, which is verse 41. It's a familiar passage. As the words are read and the scene unfolds, you will remember it so well. The following day, Jesus decided to go into Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Philip was a man from Bethsaida, the town that Andrew and Peter came from. Now Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have discovered the man whom Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets wrote too. He is Jesus, the son of Joseph, and comes from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, retorted Nathanael? You come and see, replied Philip. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and remarked, Now, here is a true man of Israel. There is no deceit in him. How can you know me, returned Nathanael? When you were underneath the fig tree, replied Jesus, before Philip even called you, I saw you. At which Nathanael exclaimed, Master, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Do you believe in me, replied Jesus, because I said I had seen you underneath that fig tree? You are going to see something greater than that, believe me. I tell you all that you will see heaven wide open and God's angels ascending and descending around the Son of Man. We come now to offer our prayer unto God. The other day, Ed Gill, our state treasurer, was telling me about a man who late in life came to Christ and who was informed by his minister that as a Christian he ought to pray in public. Well, the man, sincerely converted, said if he had to pray in public as a Christian, he wanted to pray in public. He had some hesitation, as I think all of us do. But he said to the preacher, he said, but how do you close a prayer? How do you sign off? How do you know when you're at the end, you know? And the preacher said, well, you use a word that's the most universal word of all. You just say amen and people know you're through. Well, he thought that was simple enough. Only if you can remember your first prayer in public, the man became considerably confused and as he prayed on and on, he couldn't remember what the closing word should be. And he prayed for the Baptists and he prayed for the Methodists and he prayed for the Lutherans and he prayed for the Episcopal, all the time trying to remember what's that universal word by which you close. And finally, in desperation, Ed Gill, and Ed Gill vouches for the authenticity of it, the man just simply closed by saying, yours truly, R.Y. Corbett. <laughs> well, you know, there's something great about that, isn't there? Can we honestly say to God when we pray, I know we come to him in the name of Christ, but can we honestly say, yours truly? Can we? When we come to God in prayer to know, okay, here we are bringing our thanks, bringing our hopes, bringing our desires, and end it on the fervent note. Yours truly, Bill Enlow. Yours truly, Jimmy Little. Yours truly, Jane Black. Yours truly, anybody here. What does that say about our relationship to God when we can close a prayer like that? May it be in that sense of intimacy that we come to God now in prayer.
Our Father, are we really yours truly? Or may it be said of business, yours truly? Or family? Or recreation? Or the stock market? or some hobby. So many things, our Father, where we are more truly yours than we are thine. But, O oh God, help us to see it isn't an impossible struggle. For none of us, our Father, are partially wedded to other interests and activities, but what we long to be wholly wedded to thee and, O oh God, if a divorce from worldly things is pending, help us to be encouraged. None of us, Lord, are climbing the heights overnight. And for some, it's so much easier to journey upwards than it is for others. But, O oh God, no matter how strange people some of us are temperamentally, May we not become discouraged. May we see something this past week, our Father, that did encourage us. A time, maybe, when we kept our mouths shut. Or a time, maybe, when, in favor of the right, we spoke out when others were denying it or disclaiming it. A time, maybe, Lord, when we forgot the comforts of our own home to go forth and to be helpful to others in need. A time, Lord, maybe, when we put our own interests behind us in order that we might become a part of the main interest of the family. A time, Lord, when not all the imaginings of the mind were evil, but some were good. O oh, gracious God, may there be some bright glimpse, some good assurance of such onward progress in our lives to take with us into this week. And may we know, our Father, that if we can but hold on to what gain we've made, thou wilt help us by the power of thy Holy Spirit to gain a wee bit more. Our thanks ascend for those who've come back to us from Christmas vacation, who've returned to the campuses of our colleges and our universities. O oh God, as we this morning renew these Christian ties, we know it's good for us. May they feel it's good for them. And we remember our own high schoolers, Lord, as they live under the shadow of exams. Some of us, can relive our own days and remember what pesky times they were. I guess, Lord, if some of us had worked as hard as we lamented, we would have done better. But, O oh God, may they know that no man ever does his best and then seeks thy help but what thou wilt help. Not, Lord, that every man will be an honor roll student, but we do know, our Father, that having done our best, thou wilt not then forsake us when we need thy undergirding help, the inspiring power of thy Holy Spirit, the ability, O oh God, to recollect and use what we know. So may that faith and that confidence be theirs. And may it be ours, for all of us, our Father, take exams. All of us have to give some accounting almost every day of what we've learned and acquired in the past. We thank thee that when we fail, there is forgiveness. And when we succeed, there is joy. And in the name of him who came, that his joy might be in us, that our joy might be full, Jesus the Christ.
kiss and tell. It's a wonderfully expressive statement. And I don't know how ancient a statement it is, kiss and tell. But I think I know, as you know, its basic meaning. Where the sermon in the words is simply this, that you and I, before we express ourselves on anything or anyone, ought to have experience with that thing or that person. Kiss and tell, I think, simply implies that companionship, you see, ought to precede our expression of opinion that we are to be silent on that with which we have had no association or experience whatsoever. And you know, there's a marvelous variation in this expression. Maybe we can find in kiss and tell certain sets, certain combinations, certain variations. For instance, Sometimes we tell, but have never kissed. I would say if there's one fault of all of us today, it's simply this, that we tell, we speak out before we have ever kissed. We speak out on books, for instance, we have never read. On movies we have never viewed. On people we have never known on products we have never tried, on food we have never sampled, on situations we have never experienced, on marriages we have never witnessed, on cities we have never visited, on churches we have never supported, on Christ, to whom we've never committed ourselves, on God, whom we have never tried to apprehend, on prayer that we have never tried, on worship that we have never undertaken, on stewardship that we have never attempted. How many, you see, speak out? They tell, but they never have kissed. And this is the tragedy of our world today, that we have so many who would tell, but who have never kissed. This was the trouble with Nathaniel, of whom we read in the morning scripture. Philip simply said to him, we have found the Christ, and he comes from Nazareth. And immediately Nathanael retorted by saying, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He didn't know Nazareth, probably save, save only that from which other people had said. He didn't know Christ. He had never companioned with Christ. He was telling, but he had never kissed. But when he did kiss, when in a brief moment he came to know the Christ, it was different. Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. When he could kiss, when he had kissed, he could really tell. But how many misfortunes do you and I establish and create because we tell before we have ever kissed? One of the great theologians of a few years ago of Scotland was Dr. John Bailey. Some of you may remember reading one of his brief but pregnant with information books entitled Invitation to Pilgrimage. In that book, Dr. Bailey writes these words, It has been my own lot to be constantly involved in discussion with men who feel unable to identify themselves with the faith and the outlook of the Christian church. And it is seldom, if ever, that I have felt that their doubts were denials based on a true understanding of what they were doubting or denying. Then he adds, men criticize and even oppose Christianity without ever having taken much trouble to discover what it is all about. It is remarkable what nonsense is spoken about it, even by men of the highest distinction in departmental fields of knowledge. What he was saying back then is what we are saying today, that there are so many people who are telling but have never kissed. And I would say to you, pay no heed 
to those who tell if they haven't kissed, for they have nothing to tell. But there's another variation. Not only may I tell without kissing, but I think some have kissed and never told. Well, there are some situations where this is as it ought to be. You know, some of you lassies can protect the dignity of some of the guys only by kissing but never telling. But there are situations in life where we ought what? To kiss if we kiss to tell. But how many people kiss and never tell? How many of you here know this morning that God answers prayer? Have you ever quietly shared that with anyone? How many of you here know this morning that God in Christ forgives sins? When you've lived through those days when by your, when your own behavior just completely, utterly, totally shames you. And there is no resort save Jesus Christ, and then we hope an apology to those hurt and to those offended, and we come away thankful that we can somehow or other come into the presence of God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and there is that mercy, vouchsafe then. And we arise cleaner, better, happier people than when we knelt. We have kissed. We have come to know God in Christ, but we never tell. That's a tragedy too, isn't it? It may be a tragedy to tell and never have kissed, but it's also a tragedy to have kissed, to have come to know. And never tell, you see. I remember when the last visit Martin Niemuller made to the United States. Sitting one with him early one afternoon, and as this man of God who so distinguished himself in Protestant history in Germany during World War II was relating some of his experiences. He said, you know, as long as I live, the greatest sorrow in my life will be on the day that along with other Christian leaders of Germany, I was summoned into the presence of Hitler. And there reminded by Hitler that the church would speak what he wanted the church to speak, or else. He said nothing. He said, I should have told him then that neither he nor anyone else would silence the voice of God in Christ in the church of Germany. But he didn't. He had kissed, but he hadn't told. Well, maybe it was providential, for had he told then that of which he knew because he'd kissed, he probably would have been cast into prison there and then. And a man who became a stabilizing and moving force amongst the Protestants of Germany in World War II and thereafter, would never have had the effect. But for him, this was the sorrow of his life that he had kissed and he had not told. That can be a tragedy, can't it? And then there's another possibility, and that to me is this. We can kiss and tell, but we nullify, we nullify it by the way we live. We kiss and tell, but we nullify it by the way we live. This was true of, Peter, of Judas. He came that night, you remember, when the betrayal of Christ was planned, and he kissed him, and he said, Master. He had planned to kiss him. He didn't have to say, Master. But he was standing there in the presence of the Christ who had put so much of himself into this man's life and who saw in Judas tremendous possibility. And Judas kissed him because he knew who he was kissing. And whether he realized it or not, he said, Master. But his kiss and tell were nullified because by what he had planned, he betrayed what he was doing. You and I may kiss and tell on Sunday, but what if on Monday our lives make void the kiss and tell? 
But then, and this can so readily happen to us, it can happen to us when we go home, for that matter. It can happen to us this afternoon, unless constantly we seek the inspiration. We can kiss and tell, and then nullify it by the lies we live. You remember Benedict Arnold? He was a man who, who knew what kiss and tell was, yet who nullified it by his life. There was that broken, wounded, bruised leg of his, a symbol of what the man had suffered at Quebec and Saratoga. For the country about which he'd come to know and to love. And then his terrible, terrible readiness to deliver West Point into the hands of the British. Kiss and tell, but then to deny it all by the way we live. That too is possible. And so it comes down, doesn't it, to what's left? And that is simply to kiss and tell. I have said we can tell and have never kissed. I've suggested that we can kiss and never tell. I'm saying we can kiss and tell and then nullify it by the lives we live, or else we can kiss and tell and tell it gloriously and gladly and proudly by the lives we live. You remember David, you remember, as he sought the forgiveness of God and assured that God would, would forgive him, knowing that God would forgive him, said what? Then, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And time and time and throughout the Psalms, where God has dealt so marvelously with me, where they've kissed God and found out what God is like, we cannot but declare, the psalmist says, what we know. Or as John, writing in his epistle, you remember, tells us what? We cannot but speak and declare that which we have seen and that which we have heard, kiss and tell. Or as Catherine Hankey writes in the familiar words we know, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else could do. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. Kiss and tell. That's your privilege and mine. In the heart of the city, And in the suburbs where we live. It can either be telling by those who have never kissed, or it can be kissing and never telling, or it can be kissing and telling but having our lives nullified, or it can be kissing and telling, and all the glorious tribute to him who has redeemed us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Kiss and tell. Our Father, I, we thank thee for who thou art and what thou art. We thank thee that we come to know thee in the Christ. Through him we kiss thee. And he's so much more to each one of us, our Father, than maybe we've ever really admitted to anyone. O oh God, may we lay to heart what these simple words of old tell us, kiss and tell. And in the name of him who knew thee because he came from thee and was going back to thee, and who has come to tell us of it so gloriously in the life lived and the word spoken and in the broken body and the conquering resurrection, Jesus the Christ. And now may he who alone can enable us to stand faultless and with joy in thy presence be honor and glory 
tribute and power on community and campus, in company or in solitude, in business or in leisure, at home or in dormitory, now and all the days of this week. Oh.